Acting as moderator for session two is Miss Valerina Daniel. She is the news anchor in Berita Satu. With courtesy, I am handling over the session to Miss Valerina Daniel. Baik, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Peace be upon us, Om Swastiastu, Nama Budaya. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Valerina Daniel. Thank you for joining us in the second session of Voyage to Indonesia Seminar, Women Participation for Economic Inclusiveness. So this morning, we have learned that the level of women participation in economy globally is increasing. However, it's still facing a lot of challenges as well as of opportunities. And one of the challenges that exists today is the digital transformation and in the world's business. And so there is uh, cloud computing, AI, automation, and the internet of things, and all of this are influencing the way we do business today. So in this kind of situation, how can we upgrade the level of women participation in the workplace? Or even we can help them to enter this new uh, digital era of economy. Or maybe there's also, we can say that there's no workplace anymore because nowadays, we don't have to go to the office. Sometimes we can do our work at home or even we can do it at Starbucks <laughs> oh, because they have good Wi-Fi, good coffee, but not so good to our pockets because sometimes it sells the coffee with a high price. However, uh, this situation uh, maybe raise some questions. For example, I would like to ask you questions like, how many of you work in an office? Can you please raise your hand? Okay, so I see most of you work in an office. How many of you work from home? One, two, three. Okay, four. So most of us in, our, in this room work from the office. But don't you know, I mean, um, do you know that these days a lot of women work from home because of the digital transformation allows them to sell from uh, home because they have this Instagram, Facebook, and a lot of social medias, and also the marketplace like Tokopedia, and also um, Sophie, a lot of uh, marketplace that existed in Indonesia today. So this kind of situation uh, raises some questions, whether this is situation is opportunities or face uh, or give us more challenges in helping women to enter the workplace in the future. So that's why we are going to talk about this today, uh, about what kind of education, what kind of skills, and what kind of policy that should be provided by the government and also other institutions to support women in order to enter the workplace in the future. So today we have six distinguished panelists. The first one is Ibu Amalia Adiningar Widya Santi. The Senior Advisor to the Minister for Economic and Financing, Ministry of National Development Planning, or BAPANAS. Please give a warm applause to Ibu Amalia. Silakan Ibu, di tengah. Okay, our next panel is panelist is Bapak Julius, Assistant Deputy of Manpower, Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs. Please give a warm applause to Bapak Julius. Our next presenter is Ms. Lisa Kolovich, Team Leader for Gender Research from IMF. Please give a warm applause to Ms. Lisa Kolovich. And then we also have Bapa Erwin Haryono, Head of Financial Technology, Payment System, Cooperation and Communication Group from Bank Indonesia. 
And we have Ms. F. Cleo Kawawaki, Deputy Director General of ADB Southeast Asia Department. And we have Ibu Sinta Danuwardoyo, CEO of Bubu.com. All right, we have six panelists today. Uh, at first, I'm going to give each of you five minutes to answer the first question. And then after that, we're going to have a Q&A session with the uh, audience in this room. All right, the first question will be for Ibu Amalia or Ibu Winnie. Uh, so how Bapanas could elevate the capability of women to participate in the national economy, especially in this digital era? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course, Bapanas is really concerned with uh, how Indonesia can empower women to the economy because we realize that uh, you know, low participation of labor force of women in our economy is still low. So meaning that to untap this potential, we, we still need to support uh, the women to be able to participate in the labor force or in, other, in, in the other way that she or even though they are not uh, entering the labor force, we can empower women to do the economic activity so it can contribute to the uh, e economic growth. So, you know, uh, based on our calculation, uh, now that uh, women, uh, you know, that the, the participation of women in the labor force for women is only 5.1 out of 10 women uh, which is in the labor force. So meaning that uh, when, when men, men 8.2 8 out of 10 men is working, but only 5.1 women out of 10 is working. So based on our calculation, if the women participation in the labor force is increasing to 64%, which is in the same level as Thailand, has now, then we will have the additional of 20 million uh, labor force in our economy. So I think uh, this is the w one way of uh, uh, potentials that women can contribute more to, the, our, to our economy. And for that, uh, we have medium term planning document and then we put women empowerment as a priority of our development. And the other one that uh, we also um, uh, have strategies to increase roles of women in the economy. Uh, the first strategy is to give higher access and provide ease to women to play double roles, which is as a working woman, uh, and at the same time, he's, she is also as a housewife. The second strategy is to increase women access to health and education services. And the third one is to increase access and provide facilities to new economic activities, such as to empower women entrepreneurships or to provide new working opportunities for women. And the question is that why do women need to participate in the economic activities? So. Uh, the reason is because when women participate in the economic activities, then we can help to control our population growth. And then the second one is we can bring women to be financially independent. And then the third one, we can uh, help women to be able to involve in any decision making in the family. And meaning that they have uh, the women when they are working, they they, they they are more independent. They can have says or in 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 family. The fourth one that we can increase year of marriage, and the last one is to reduce gender birth and preferences. And if you don't mind, I just would like to share one video. Uh, what what is the video? 
is about inclusive economic development index where Bapenas just launched this index last June in 11. Why this is the index? Because one of the component of the index is actually uh, women empowerment in that pillar. So meaning that the women uh, empowerment can help also to improve the econ inclusive economic development. Thank you. So now we're going to see the video. Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay. Pembangunan ekonomi bukanlah tujuan akhir, melainkan sarana untuk terus meningkatkan kesejahteraan rakyat. Untuk itu, Kementerian Perencanaan Pembangunan Nasional meluncurkan. Pembangunan ekonomi inklusif adalah pembangunan ekonomi yang menciptakan akses dan kesempatan yang luas bagi seluruh lapisan masyarakat secara berkeadilan, mengurangi tingkat kesenjangan antar kelompok dan wilayah, dan meningkatkan kesejahteraan. Indeks pembangunan ekonomi inklusif terdiri atas tiga pilar utama. Pertumbuhan ekonomi, pemerataan pendapatan dan pengurangan kemiskinan, serta perluasan akses dan kesempatan. Tiap pilar didukung oleh beberapa subpilar. Indeks pembangunan ekonomi inklusif disajikan dalam angka indeks total per tahun serta angka indeks per pilar berdasarkan skala 1 sampai 10. Indonesia saat ini sudah memiliki indeks pembangunan ekonomi inklusif untuk tingkat nasional dan seluruh provinsi di Indonesia yang dapat dijadikan rujukan bersama. Pada 2017, tiga provinsi dengan indeks pembangunan ekonomi inklusif tertinggi adalah DKI Jakarta dengan indeks sebesar 6,55, Jawa Tengah dengan indeks sebesar 5,97, Daerah Istimewa Yogyakarta dengan indeks sebesar 5,94. Indeks pembangunan ekonomi inklusif ini dibuat untuk membantu pemerintah pusat dan daerah dalam menyusun kebijakan ekonomi yang lebih inklusif, sehingga hasil-hasil pembangunan dapat dinikmati oleh seluruh lapisan masyarakat secara lebih berkeadilan. Thank you very much. Baik, uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Ibu Amalia. Next, I'm going to ask question to Bapak Julius. Um, okay, as the representative from the government, is the government ready with uh, the policy to really support uh, women participation in an inclusive economy? For example, if we're talking about uh, the technology uh, transformation, what, what kind of sector that is suitable for women participation? Uh, related with this situation, uh, you know that we have already in digital 4.0 and we're in the digital area. Of course, there is some uh, lost job, but the opportunity, the technology can can get a new job that we have to to, to enter. 
Related with this one, uh, Indonesian government already made a roadmap related to increase the, the policy related to the vocational. Uh, in this kind, especially for women, we make the vocational roadmap. The vocational roadmap is uh, approached by to from demand side or and the supply side. What is the demand side? On demand side, we have already clarified that identify what is the sector priority by government that need help by increasing the human capital and human development skill. We have already choose six sectors. The first sector is manufacture, and uh, and then our president also launching the. Indonesian making 4.0 this, for this one, already choose manufacture and uh, related with the help to program tourism in several, uh, 10 dis destination area. So in the 10 destination area, we don't have prepared with the skill development. So this is the skill development, especially for including the women and then. And then also the third priority about the agribusiness. Agribusiness related to the palm, palm tree, rubber tree, cane, coffee, and horticulture. And the fourth, the healthcare. Why the healthcare? Because we have already uh, increasing the income, middle income, and then because the health service we need it with the insurance and other things. And the fourth, the digital, digital economy, we also prepare for it. And then migrant worker. You know, the migrant worker, we don't want to just send the people as a assistant for worker. We don't need more skillful and more, uh, 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 more quality people. So we need to to this one. Uh, in this term, related with the supply side, we have to revitalize about three vocational education in Indonesia. At first, we know in senior high school, in senior high school in Indonesia, we have two general school and vocational school. In related to vocational, we need to, to revitalize it. And the second about the, we have the polytechnic. This for the polytechnic. We emphasize for increasing the people skillful for the kind uh, in if industry, they are the operator. And then and, uh, above the apparatus, there is the so-called white color job. So we need to prepare. And, and then Indonesia, under the Ministry of Manpower, we have uh, government institute training, this the, the so-called balai latihan kerja. In Indonesia, maybe Indonesian people know about that. Then so we need to, 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 to help for the people, especially for the women, if we want to, to work for them. So what we should we, we do in related to this one? The first we have reforming in educational institution. The first we change the curriculum. The curriculum that we have used now is already absolute. We need to 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 in, to suitable the curriculum, especially with digital economy, especially for the Indonesian 4.4.0. This is the first thing, and then we need to to increase the training of trainer to the people, to the, the, to the lecture. Because as you know, if we calculate only 30% of lecture is the so-called is productive. What the meaning is productive? The lectures know about the practice. Because in Indonesia, only 30%. The last is only about know about theory. Lecture, guru, in the polytechnic, in SMK, only know about the uh, theory. So we need to give a TOT for this, uh, for this one. And also improving the accreditation skill, accreditation for the school. And then also we need uh, increase developing competency standard. The standard that need really competence and other recognized by the industry recognized by the people around the world that until now we are not yet recognized by other 
um, yeah, like for example, if someone uh, get the certification from the Indonesian government and from, for example, from the Dehatsu industry, of course, choose from Dehatsu. We don't believe with the certificate because we need to recognize it. And the third, the building internship ecosystem. Last two years, the Pak Jokowi already long, launching the national internship program. Then we need to change the internship problem with the new uh, revitalism. For example, the last when the people internship, they have only two jobs: making a copy and making a photocopy. There are no rule for the internship. But now we have to capitalize what is the mechanism for internship, and then we have to pay 60% for the minimum wage if someone going to internship. This is the, the. And then also we improving infrastructure and practical equipment. In Indonesia, the practical equipment infrastructure for education vocational already absolute. If we calculate. Uh, uh, we we uh, we lag behind around two decades. You can imagine if we lag behind two decades, and order so we have already facing uh, industrial 4.0 and other things. So, and the fourth is uh, try government to arrange unemployment benefit and skill development, then active to coordination about the all of the system. This is two things that we have approached by demand side and approached by supply side. Maybe probably we may discuss later. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Payulius, for giving us uh, the broad uh, description about uh, the sectors that can involve uh, women more in the future. Now I'm moving on to uh, Ibulisa, Ms. Lisa. Uh, we know that you made a book called Fiscal Policy and Gender Equality. So, what is the highlight from that study? Sure. So, um, as at the IMF, as part of this, this project we've been funded from by the UK's Department for National Development, we undertook a global study of gender budgeting efforts, which is really the use of fiscal policy, so spending and tax policies, and how those can be used to reduce gender gaps around the world. Um, we identified 23 countries that have prominent gender budgeting initiatives, and after looking at kind of these prominent gender budgeting initiatives, we came up with some key lessons learned, some key takeaways for what governments can do if they're interested in looking at gender budgeting. Um, now, let me just step back a little bit and talk about what kind of gender budgeting is. Um, so, like I said, it's the use of fiscal policies to address gender gaps. It is not a separate budget for women. Um, it doesn't necessarily entail more spending on women, but what it does mean is identifying where are these crucial gender gaps and how do we want to use spending to reduce those gender gaps? Um, typically, it's things like gender gaps in education and health outcomes um, and labor force participation. So governments are trying to reduce those gaps there. Now, some of the lessons learned, um, what we found from key successful gender budgeting initiatives is that the initiatives that are led by ministries of finance tend to be more sustained and they, are ten they tend to be more successful. So when we see countries like Rwanda, Uganda, Morocco, where the ministries of finance are really stepping up and leading these programs, um, the efforts are sustained and we're seeing outcomes. Um, so we're now starting to do more research and looking at the causal relationships between gender budgeting and gender equality outcomes, but just kind of at a, at a correlation at an association level, uh, we're seeing more improvements when the ministry of finance is leading. Um, we also have seen countries too introduce legal requirements for gender budgeting. And and this often has um, large implications, not just for gender budgeting, but also for gender equality as a whole in the country. So when legal barriers uh, to women's participation in the economy are, are, are um, reduced, or when countries are using legal requirements to, um, to force the government to look at uh, gender equality um, and use gender budgeting as a way to address those equalities, um, those legal requirements make a big difference. Um, we also see, too, that gender budgeting is not something that has to be done just at um, an advanced country level. In in fact, some of the most innovative practices are coming out of um, sub-Saharan Africa. We see Rwanda and Uganda really leading the way with some of the work that they've been doing. Um, so there is a lot that governments can do in terms of addressing uh, gender equality through the budgets. And let me just give you a few examples of what 
um, what we've looked at too. Uh, so in terms of you know, financial inclusion, uh, which is an, a, an issue that the IMF has been looking at closely, um, we know that financial inclusion is not gender neutral, and this is something that a budget might be able to address. Um, so we know that worldwide, about only 65% of women have access to formal bank accounts, 72% for men. Um, and so when governments start to think about how can we improve access to finance, sometimes it's removing legal barriers, sometimes it's um, providing safe transportation for women to get to banks or to be able to open up businesses. Um, so this all kind of falls under the umbrella of, of gender budgeting. Um, and we, we've seen from our research too that um, improving women's access to financial um, to financial services is associated with an increase in education rates, especially tertiary education too. Uh, so all of these, these components tend to, um, to work together and are very crucial to look at when, when you're thinking about reducing gender gaps. It's not just the fact that if you want to increase education in a country, you just build a school. Um, sometimes it's also improving access to sanitation facilities, access to water, um, because if girls are spending a lot of time on unpaid care burdens at home, accessing water, um, fetching firewood, whatever it is, um, they don't have time to invest in education. So you can't just build a school and expect girls to come, which is something we've seen in some countries. Uh, so it's the idea of taking a very holistic and, and complete approach to thinking about gender gaps, using data collection, using gender-based analysis to identify those gaps, and then identifying what components of the budget can be used to close those gender gaps um, has been quite important. So the, the highlights are included in, in the book, but we also have quite a bit more information on, on our website. Um, we have a toolkit that we've developed, um, and of course now we're starting to look at this um, for many other countries too. And it was exciting to hear this morning, um, hearing the, the Minister of Finance speak about gender budget in Indonesia too. So it's something that I think uh, is a great tool that really can be used um, and thinking too about you know, with education and access to technology and how the future of work will be changing for women. Um, that's something that can certainly be addressed uh, through a gender budgeting initiative. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, now our uh, next speaker is uh, Baba Erwin. So since uh, Ms. Lisa already mentioned about uh, the access uh, to financial system, for example, for women now only 65% compared to 70% of men. So what has the central bank uh, do in order to help women uh, to get access to financial system uh, uh, these days? Um, it's a very hard question. <laughs> if, if, you, if you don't mind, can I use my slides just, just to help me um, with the presentation because there are some numbers in it? Okay. timing is already <laughs> so um, okay uh, next please so we, we talk about this um, you know um, digital economy which is really big uh, transformative and so on and so it's supposed to be um, um, empowering but at the same time it's gonna be disruptive uh, next slide and then woman uh, in in this sense next slide please uh, it's really um, in, in the group of, of uh, uh, not a good situation N next slide please so if you if you look at here I think a uh, woman in, in a very um, difficult situation in digital economy um, today, right? So that's, that's the situation whether you like it or not. Because woman is not ready to enter this new world. Um, if you look at, for example, some, some numbers where 52% um, labor forces participation rate and even 80% 80, 80 of them in, in informal sector and it's really, really, um, really um, small amount um, in, in, in the financial uh, assets. So uh, that's, that's the situation. So next slide, please. Um, but then at the same time, it, it creates opportunity. I don't think we talk about um, threat alone, right? And also opportunity. We've been talking about the financial inclusion, how it will boost um, the woman participation in the, in, the, in the economy. But at the same time, if you really think about it, there's, uh, there's something like marketplace, probably um, from bubu.com we'll talk about it later. But I think this is also a good opportunity for women to be participate in, in, in the new world because it, it creates um, a really nice flexibility uh, and so on and so forth. So, so uh, of course, there's, there's a, a big opportunity there. Next slide. But uh, we have really have to do something about it because uh, today they're not ready. Right? So we, we have really have to do a lot in, in this uh, in this area, digital literacy, uh, financial inclusion, and, and so on and so forth. Because all those numbers you can you can see um, in the slides is really really um, it's not really in a, in a good starting point actually. So we, we really have to do about it uh, to, to to get uh, those those opportunity. Next slide. 
um, something like um, you know um, the provide, providing the access, developing interests, acquire skills, um, entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth. Lot lot of things to do, and then. Um, I think all the government agencies, including the bank, uh, the central bank, have to be coordinated. We, we, we at least now, like, we have like six or seven ministries to talk about uh, the e-commerce in Indonesia, but I think we should do more, uh, especially in, in the coordination. Next slide, please. So uh, we, in, in Bank Indonesia, also actually, uh, we, we do a lot in, in SMEs, and in, in that sense, we also talk a lot about about the, the women empowering uh, empowerment in in, in the small scale um, industries. Next slide. For example, here are the, the 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 figures. So we have 46 branches around around the countries. Uh, we have a lot. We have more than 200 um, clusters around 700 um, SMEs. Um, but still, um, um, the, 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 the woman participation in, in this project is still quite small, so we, we'd like to, to, to boost that. And then, on, in order to do that, I don't think the bank can, can do it alone. So uh, I think we, we have no, um, uh, next, next slide. We, 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 we look around and, and find that a lot of uh, government agencies really talk about this, this e-commerce. So at least six to seven, um, um, about those um, initiatives, and, and they want those um, um, SMEs to be to be in the marketplace for, for them to, 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 to get an access to the new world of the digital economy. Next slide, please. We we even have the presidential uh, regulation in it, talking about end to end. Uh, but then in the next slide, uh, I think we, we'd like to, uh, to to contribute more to to the to the um, to the situation. We, we have now um, in the bank have a, a really uh, big initiatives to, to help the government in, in doing uh, this, this e-commerce project by, by making end-to-end -end project from product to quality uh, assurance to fin fintech in, in payment, fintech in finance, even to uh, also uh, up to this um, logistic, for example. In order to do that, we, do ha we really have to have a, a very nice uh, strategy and then quite sadly, sadly because um, even the data, the database for, for the e-commerce is, is still not there. So uh, I think this is a good opportunity for, for us uh, today to, 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 to announce that we now have these initiatives and would like to have a cooperation with Julius, with Bu Amalia, probably with Bubu.com as well, to, to work together in this, in, 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 in that, um, big initiative. We really would like to, to involve a uh, woman participation, and and hopefully it it will work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Now uh, our next uh, panelist is okay, Miss Cleo. So we know that uh, you are um, in the Southeast Asia region. So. What is the trend uh, for women participation level in this area? Okay. okay well, thank you for that question. Um, that's uh, one that uh, has been really in center in our minds because uh, uh, we've just uh, issued our strategy for 2030. And uh, during all the consultations, all the analysis, uh, women's empowerment, uh, reach towards equality has become one of the major pillars in our strategy. So looking at it from my region, um, we look at the sex uh, disaggregated data on internet use, it's not too well. <laughs> uh, it seems that some countries, uh, well, overall in Asia, I mean, Pakistan and Bangladesh, they're doing much worse in terms of access. Our region is doing much better. Uh, it's about 0.86 percent, uh, well, one to one. So from the looking at the global phenomenon as well, I mean, it only leads to a vicious cycle of, well, less access, less um, knowledge, less entrepreneurship, and it goes on. So that is a cost barrier, and there's a cost barrier and an access barrier, and we have to get rid of both. Uh, so digital econ uh, transformation of economy and society um, needs to tackle with both these areas of access and, well, knowledge in 
being able to use. Well, uh, from our interventions, what we see as very much of a success is especially in uh, Indonesia. Because uh, what we see is that, uh, well, we started this program in 2008 on the technical vocational education in technology, and um, we had uh, quotas on the enrollment. And uh, it indicates that, uh, well, just with quotas on enrollment, uh, the increase in people, go women going into uh, technology uh, was gone from 13% uh, to 19%. And uh, this is the very good part where 50% of all entrants into the technical vocational education came up with a job, a very high paying job, a good job within a year. I mean, which is, and it didn't matter whether they were women or men because it was really, there was a demand for these skills. And the other policy option in looking at technology and access that uh, seemed to work is, um, well, the going to the, uh, well, what do you call it, uh, the low uh, income populations and giving the support to those populations and the opportunity uh, to go into these trainings. And the final one that, uh, well, is coming up now is uh, the, well, the labor rights. Okay, because these uh, new jobs in the technical fields, um, there are less women, uh, and you see it in Silicon Valley as well, right? Where women are discriminated against, they don't get the top jobs, they don't get the best pay, because, you know, all the top guys are men. So it really needs government's little push to say that really um, these women should be supported, they should be protected, and they should be able to get the, have the opportunities uh, to grow because that's the only way you're going to change uh, their landscape for these kind of jobs. All right, so our last uh, panelist is uh, Ibu Sinta. So uh, we want to know your opinion about the current situation because um, you are one of the pioneers in uh, you know, um, building uh, a business in the digital era uh, in Indonesia. Yes. Uh, so what do you think of the current situation? Is it better giving more opportunities for women or uh, else, what do you think? Definitely, uh, if you know, I started my first business in 1996, so I've been in the tech business for 22 years already. Uh, so definitely comparing 1996 to now is totally different. And we've seen how uh, digital and tech has actually disrupted the whole economy. Um, if I can mention uh, our favorite apps is Gojek, for instance. Uh, they now have about more than a million drivers uh, they're in more than 50 cities and they're in three countries now. So definitely it has changed our way of life. Um, and, and I believe that uh, tech actually um, is able to help close the gender disparity and um, help to move uh, women and um, help women to actually uh, run business more easily. Uh, can you help with my slide? I want to show you a bit of slide and a little bit of video later on. Next. Um, oh, let me show you a video. Uh, so our uh, company, Bubu.com, we, uh, we do a tech conference every two years. It's called the ID Byte, and we have the Bubu Awards. And uh, last year, um, I had the honor to have Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, to actually send us a video on women in tech because uh, I did a panel on women in tech and uh, fortunately, I do know Cheryl personally and she sent me this very special video about how women in tech and how it has also helped the economy. Can we see the video really quick? Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook and the founder of Lean In and Option B. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I'm glad to have a chance to join you via video. I want to start by congratulating Shinta for bringing everyone together and for launching ID Byte's first woman empowerment in tech panel. 
This is a subject very close to my heart because we know that tech needs more women and women need more opportunities in tech. Women are consistently underrepresented in the digital economy, just as we're underrepresented in other sectors and industries across the globe. At Facebook and LeanIn, we encourage women to lead. It's good for business, good for women, and good for the world. And when women's perspectives are represented, we build better products. We're looking forward to learning more from all of you, the leaders and innovators who make Indonesia one of the most vibrant and fascinating places in the world. Okay, uh, can I have my presentation? No. Can I have my deck? <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, uh, Facebook actually did a research and uh, they were saying that in a number of, I mean, in a lot of the countries, um, the women run business exceeded the men for inside Facebook, okay? the Facebook platform, of course. So um, this shows that actually with uh, simple technology like a social media application or platform, um, women can actually start their own business because, you know, uh, it gives them and provides with them a flexibility. They can just do it from home, you know, and they can still take care of the family, the house, and still become a housewife, a mom. <laughs> and so um, this is actually giving uh, more empowerment to any women um, to start their own business. And as you can see, this is uh, the slide here shows that actually Indonesia is ranking number two in terms of women leaders uh, across the world. And so um, the way I see it after all these years in the business, um, I've seen more women leaders also in the tech sector that actually uh, creating uh, big companies um, and um, also taking uh, leadership roles in the tech uh, company. For instance, uh, we had uh, right now uh, the CEO of IBM is also a woman. And before that, we had um, Ibu Betty Alishabana. She was running IBM Indonesia for like about 10 years. And so uh, that shows a lot of the Indonesian women uh, actually with the, with the tech sector, uh, we are moving forward. Uh, next, next slide. Of course, the easiest uh, for women to tap in would be e-commerce because e-commerce uh, platform can be done from anywhere. Um, even using a very simple social media like Facebook, Instagram, you can actually start running your own business. If you can see here, this is like uh, the different uh, e-commerce sites in Indonesia. And I want to highlight the one in number five, which is called Hijab. Hijab is actually a marketplace for a Muslim, a women Muslim fashion. And it is run by a young girl, which well, is still young, because she's 32 years old. Uh, it's a seven years old company, and her name is Dia Jeng. Next slide, please. Yeah, so she founded this is in 2011. Um, and she started with only 14 tenants and two employees. Now it becomes like uh, one of the top uh, e-commerce site in Indonesia and is actually sending products in the 50 different countries and uh, I know she has more than 200 employees and more than hundreds and hundreds of vendors so it shows how um, you know anyone can start their own business even being a woman with the help of technology thank you thank you so we're right on time now we're going to moving on to our uh, next session uh, before I hand uh, over the session to the audience, uh, I would like to raise uh, one more question for each panelist uh, to follow up your uh, argumentation in the first session. So first to Ibu Amalia, uh, I'm glad that Bapana is now prioritizing women participation in the economy in their policy. So um, what do you think is the best uh, education should be provided for women in this digital era because we know that uh, we have limited access, for example, for uh, finance uh, support, and then uh, uh, the government has already uh, changed the curriculum. But what kind of a suggestion that can be provided by Bapanas in terms of you know making the educations be more supportive to women in the future? I think one of uh, one way that we can support. Uh, women to participate in the digital economy era is to promote uh, women to take engineering schools. Because if you know that there is still a gap, wide gap between women and men in engineering schools, like was when I was in engineering school, it's only like 
only 10 women out of 90 uh, university students in that engineering school. I think uh, because this is digital economy era, and then we, we need to encourage women also to take engineering uh, as a part of their career life. Uh, another um, example that you provide for us is uh, the level of index. I think we need to change the index of the uh, okay. The index uh, that uh, that we watch in the video. Uh, I know that DKI Jakarta yeah. is the highest, right. uh, but we also know that DKI Jakarta is the capital city. So it's probably. Uh, well, we understand why probably it's the highest level. But what about the rural area? What kind of strategy that the Bapanas would uh, implement it? In the rural area, actually, they have, I mean, uh, because you know that uh, the, the years of schooling in the rural area is lower than the years of schooling of women in, this, in the urban area. So in that case, that we, uh, the government also have one program. We call it uh, uh, women schooling. In the, in the rural areas. So this is actually, uh, we would like to support that when women in the, in the, in the, in the rural area can also go to school or we can, uh, they can also do training as they want and as they, they need. And then, uh, we w and then that, uh, that, w that schooling of for women for, for the grassroots is actually uh, 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 for for increase their capability for social life and also to increase their capability to how they can uh, access to the economy, access to, to the, the opportunities created from uh, the, 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 the daily life. And the other, uh, uh, the other um, uh, program that the government has is to also to, to, to provide some uh, training or education for the creative economy. So meaning that uh, women at home, the housewife, is trained uh, for uh, do, uh, using the computer, the simple using of the computer, so they can access to the social media, they can, as, as uh, Ibu Sinta just know, they can try to start uh, access social media to sell something, a simple one. And also they, 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 they learn in that uh, program, women also learn about coding, simple programming, and also uh, uh, meaning that to reduce the gap of women to, to, to the digital divides. I think this is very important in this digital economy, so meaning that we provide more opportunity for women to access a digital technology and uh, even from the simple uh, uh, level. All right. Okay, thank you, Ibu Amalia. Now to Pa Julius. I know that uh, from your uh, presentation early, uh, we know that the, the government has already making some changes, for example, uh, providing a good national, um, uh, building national ecosystem for entrepreneurship. But uh, as we also know that the digital literacy uh, for women especially is still uh, low uh, these days in Indonesia. Um, mm -hmm. So how do we anticipate the risk uh, that could happen uh, to these women uh, in terms of uh, preparing themselves to challenge uh, this situation? Uh, thank you. Basically, we have four strategy related to maybe the, uh, to police to improve women participation to work in digital economic area. The first, encourage women participate in education, part particularly in the field of science, technology, engineering, and maths. As Pa Bu Wini said, we meet, need women participate with the STEM. And then, related with this one, what the strategy? As you know, we have ordinary organization to send the people send the people Indonesian with the so-called LPDP. Yeah. So in LPDP, we emphasize for the new LPDP because we are still revitalized with LPDP, emphasize send the people related to STEM, science, technology, and, and also gives 
priority for scholarship for the women. This is the first target. And the second, improving gender equity in getting job opportunity. Well, the ADB said or improving the regulation. We, we implementing effective regulation of empower such as decent wage implementation. This is uh, the, the, the action. And then enforcing law for any institution that disobey regulation of gender equity. This is the action. And the second, third strategy, encouraging women participate in you to utilize technology development. What, what is it? Conducting training for Indonesian training institution, BLK, in utilizing digital technology and encouraging, encouraging SME to use digital technology so that women can utilize it. And the fourth, encouraging flexibility way working for women in digital economy area. As Pa Erwin said, in digital area, women have opportunity, opportunity because as the Indonesian culture, women have to work with his husband and care the, the children, but they still have time for working in their home. So this is what kind of opportunity, encouraging coding, as you know, Indonesia, we have already calculated. We don't have a people uh, know about big data and about the coding for the expert. So that's why, you know, Gojek never use Indonesian people for the expert for the good, uh, coding and the big data. So we need to, to build this school to build this one in order to, 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 to make this one. So that's why our, religious, religi uh, our regulation related to, uh, uh, to use uh, foreign, 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 foreign labor related to the important thing that we don't have it, we, have, we give this kind of easy to move to in Indonesia. And then facilitating fund access for startup digital. Okay, for the, before the, uh, the exam, uh, number fifth, number fifth uh, presentation, our, my presentation. And then in Indonesia, agency of creative creative economy has been conducting coding mom and programming training for housewife. Coding mom target is housewife. Number of training increasing from 2016 to 20 from. 70 people to be uh, 239 people. What is the material for training? The first is web developer, internet, marketer, front end, and uh, UX controller. And then for the, the right side, my presentation at which country has the largest proportion of female developer? We have quite happy, we have a number 10 with contribution about the female around uh, fifth. 15, 15 percent. This is from the uh, collected by hacker rank. So this is my presentation. So we are number 10, yeah. So we have a lot of potentials uh, in uh, developing women in the tech uh, era. Uh, now, uh, the next question is to uh, Ms. Lisa. You said that uh, Rwanda is leading the way in developing gender budgeting. Uh, can you explain why? And then uh, my next question is, is it helpful to have women as our financial finance minister in Indonesia? <laughs> so on that first question, as speaking as an individual, I would certainly say yes. I think it's always helpful to have uh, women in positions of power um, and, and leadership and authority because, again, that's, that sets the, the stage. It provides a role model, and it also provides diversity, differences of opinion. Um, and so having different groups, different women at the table, I think is always important. And that's something that has come up in, in gender budgeting, too, where we see that when you give women a voice, when you give women a seat at the table, things happen. Things are done differently. Um, and, and projects are implemented more effectively uh, by giving women that, that chance to voice their opinion and to be heard. Um, so, uh, yes. Um, for Rwanda, uh, and, and like I said, there are many other countries, but let me just talk a bit about Rwanda. Um, one of the things that they've done is taken this idea of um, 
data collection and analysis very seriously. Um, and to do that, they've implemented something called the gender, the gender Monitoring Office. Now, the Gender Monitoring Office has been collecting data, which allows them to then look at what are some of the outcomes after they've, they've been working on gender budgeting. Um, and so one thing that they did um, was looking at how many people are involved uh, in terms of men and women in, in different activities, so different types of employment, um, how many women and girls are going to school, and what are they actually studying. And they found that in terms of um, science and technology education, it was about 25% um, about of the students were girls. Um, and so what does that information do? Well, it empowers the leaders then to look and see if we care about educating more girls in science and technology and we see that the numbers are this low, what kinds of programs can we put in place? What kinds of things should we do differently perhaps? Um, and so we were in Rwanda last year for a conference uh, that we did jointly with UN Women and uh, the Rwandan Ministry of Finance and Rwandan Ministry of Gender, um, the Ngozi Institute. And what we found, oh, we did these, these field trips in the afternoon, and what we found in the afternoon field trip to one of the sites was um, they have this, this training institute set up where it's not specifically done for women and men, but it's really just anybody who's interested in learning about new technologies, anybody who's interested in learning about water purification systems or um, repairing machines or doing um, computer graphics or other kinds of, of innovative technologies can go to this, this school and learn how to do this. So it, it was more of this, this um, like conscious decision to say we want to educate more women, we want to break down these barriers, we want to put them into kind of non-traditional non uh, gender roles, how can we do that? And this institute was, was set up with the idea of encouraging more girls to go into to different fields like this. Um, but again, it's really not, here's the boys, here's the girls, here's the men, here's the women, it's just people are interested in this, let's get them all together and have them learn about it. Um, so again, kind of key takeaways from Rwanda, looking at gender data, analyzing the data, and then using that data to make better decisions has been very important. Um, and we see that again in other countries too, but that data collection has been so crucial in terms of actually figuring out where the gender gaps are and how can we improve that through, um, through governments and through, through other organizations as well. Okay, from the policies that have been provided by the representative of our government here today, what do you think of the policy? Is it uh, good enough to reduce the gender gap in Indonesia? Oh, so that, um, that I don't know. <laughs> um, it, of course, takes a long time to, to reduce gender gaps, right? So we can implement a policy now, and, you know, we'll see that it might not have payoffs for, for years. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the World Economic Forum, and this was mentioned this morning, um, is predicting that it will take over 200 years to close gender gaps. Now, I, for one, certainly hope that's not true. Um, and I say this as not only an individual, as an economist, but as a mother, um, and I hope that that is not the reality that, that our children will face. Um, but that being said, putting policies into place now are quite important, um, but it's also being agile enough to realize that if the policy that you have in place, if the spending program you have in place, the tax policy that you have in place is not working, um, then you adjust, right? And so it's also to learning from other countries, right? The, the idea that Indonesia would be introducing gender budgeting you know, I, I'm not going to say that that's going to fix things in, in one year, two years, three years. I mean, it takes time for all these things. And we certainly see like a Rwanda or Uganda who've been doing gender budgeting now for 10, 15 years. Still, they still have a long way to go in terms of closing gender gaps, right? But putting these policies into place and starting to take action is one crucial step forward. And, and, um, and we're now looking at, in terms of the research we're doing at the IMF, what are some of the, the components that without these um, components in place for gender budgeting, can the policy even succeed? Um, so we're really trying to identify what are the most crucial components, how do you implement them, and then if it's not working, how do you adjust and how do you move forward? All right, thank you. Now to Pak Erwin, uh, I know that women entrepreneurs tend to rely more on networks composed of family or, or friends. Uh, so how uh, how can we broader broad broader broaden these networks? Uh, how can we involve more people for for women so then uh, they can expand their business in in the future? Um, that's a very tough question actually. But uh, I think again, Bank Indonesia offers its help to, for, for for the government initiative to to do more on the e-commerce, and in in a sense, uh, we, again we have forty six branches uh, around the countries. Um, from um, the province also to to some small town, uh, and then we found that uh, when we deal with the SMEs, the participation um, of women is still low, actually. So that, that's that's one thing uh, that we have in mind. So that's why you know, I 
slides, one of the um, one of the pillars of the SME's um, uh, project in in the bank is to to get more women uh, in 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 that business, right? So then we, we forward. Um, knowing that the future will be the digital economy, we would like for those SMEs to be in the marketplace. Right? So uh, uh, to, to answer your question, um, it's, it's not an easy answer, but um, to, 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 to get them more involved in the SMEs is, is the crucial um, factor. I don't think, um, for example, um, probably it's much easier to, to, to bring them to, to, to to Facebook or, or Instagram, for example, but I think consumption, right? Uh, if, if you don't do production side, probably pretty difficult to, to, to have a real empowerment of a woman. So that's why we, we start with these SMEs and would like to, to have um, involvement, uh, more involvement in, in, in it. Hopefully by, by then uh, we, we, can, we can move um, them in, into the marketplace. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm excited to, to, to learn about um, um, success story, and I think uh, that's really inspirational. And um, probably that's 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 it. Would it possible to like have uh, an incentive for uh, women entrepreneurship in the future? I, I don't think I don't know actually to, to <laughs> answer the question. Um, the, the basic the basic problems is the success actually. The access. People talk about the the, the initiatives in, in the financial inclusion, um, in 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 terms of when they have an access to the financial um, account, for example, that will, will boost their participation. To be honest, I don't think so, right? Because once you have the the account, and then you still have to use that money for consumption. Probably in one or two days, it will disappear. Right? I, I don't think it, it will involve them more on, on the business uh, side. Right? So, so that's why we, we have to start with, with the production, with, with these SMEs, and, and hopefully we will have more and more, um, more and more um, women participation. To give you an illustration, actually, just um, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we, we have a kakai. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very nice um, um, event in, in, in Jakarta uh, or about, I think if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 150 uh, SMEs um, um, which, which, uh, which be helped by, by Bank Indonesia. Uh, for, for, three, for three days event at that time, they, they can reap, if I'm not mentioned, about eight billion rupiah on only for three days, right? Um, so it, it works. But, but then again, most of them are still men, right? Most of them are still men. But that, that kind of initiative, I think it's, it's, in, uh, it's, it's, it's important. And I don't see if, if we can see, uh, if we can give them some, some incentive, but we, we, I really think about it. <laughs> Probably can give me some idea, but but my point again is uh, the the financial inclusion. I don't think that's enough because if you you only talk about the financial access, I don't think it will really empower uh, women in in a, a um, sustainable way. Okay. We are going to ask uh, Ibu Sinta later for her opinion from. But uh, Erwin's <laughs> answer from that question. Okay, now uh, Ibu uh, Cleo, uh, Miss Cleo. Uh, so we know that uh, you said that, uh, that the the situation now um, is better uh, for women. Uh, but however, you said that there's uh, there's a vicious cycle about uh, women and then also the work place and then also the current situation with the digital transformation. How can we break that vicious cycle? Well, we try to con concentrate on and focus on uh, at ADB for women's empowerment uh, in this digital age is uh, lifelong skill development, especially through like the TBET programs and uh, promoting women's employment in uh, emerging non-traditional areas. And what you were saying exactly about engineering, you know, but if you go to an engineering class and all your teachers are men, 
you know, <laughs> you don't really want to raise your hand and ask questions, right? So, well, I don't know. I, I didn't feel that way when I was, you know. But one of the things that we try to do is, uh, and this is a program in Indonesia, is training uh, lecturers in engineering. And uh, up to now, we've done 500 female engineers that are for advanced degrees uh, with the National Scholarship Fund. And they're going to be the next teachers of teaching the, well, the next generation of engineers that are going to come up. So breaking the cycle by breaking the perception that engineering is not for women. Yeah. And the, one of the other things um, that we noticed is, well, why don't women go for technical vocational training? That's thought to be a male thing, right? And why, well, I mean, and that's why it's exciting to hear about coding moms because m moms being trained yes. for in coding is another breakthrough. Uh, and for young women, uh, one of the things that we did in the survey in Laos this time was that they don't want to go for TVET training because there's no female dormitory. They don't, you know, like as you were saying, they're in the rural area. TVET is uh, institutions are in the cities. There's no female dormitory. Uh, I you know my parents don't want me to go and you know stay in a house that I don't know, you know, a mixed situation. So increasing, just by having that uh, female dormitory in a polytechnic increased the women's enrollment quite significantly. So even things like that, I mean, really catering to the needs of the students, uh, the people who want to learn, moms, you know, people who have not had jobs in a while because of, you know, their requirement to have babies and raise them a bit. Uh, that's where I think uh, this digital age is very um, conducive, actually. It's leapfrogging in a way and giving new opportunities because you don't absolutely have to be in an office for eight hours a day, right? So there's so many opportunities that we can take advantage of if um, governments <laughs> could take that opportunity yes. and run with it and uh, empower uh, and generate the next generation of women empowered as well as taking advantage of the women who are already there who want to do something but haven't been able to do it because of lack of opportunity. All right, thank you. Uh, now, Ibu Sinta, do you want to uh, give comment first? <laughs> to Pak Erwin. <laughs> to Pak Erwin, before I ask you the question. Pak Erwin, definitely, you know, creating uh, opportunity for women is really important, but we also need to support them with the infrastructure. So definitely anything about finance is also helpful for us women. Um, maybe some tax break. <laughs> uh, but yeah, definitely. But um, I agree also with uh, Pak Julius, for instance, that we need also to uh, empower the women with the soft skills, uh, how we also develop their skills and get them more interested with STEM uh, because uh, without that interest, we will not have more women involved in STEM. Because I think it's also about um, stereotyping because sometimes women already think that doing technology is hard, but actually, uh, you know, with, with the latest application and everything, everything's actually very simple and easy. It's just have to get the women to be interested in it first. So probably that's just um, the very basic thing is how do we get more young girls, more women to actually be interested uh, in involving themselves with STEM and or, or you know, involving with them uh, with themselves with technology. Um, Creating infrastructure, I think, is really important. And uh, fintech, actually, I'm, I'm, I've been mentoring a lot, a number of fintech companies because um, what I do now, I invest in startups and I mentor them as well. And I think uh, that is one of the key um, solution in having the non-bankable to be able to use, uh, like for women, for instance, you know, uh, a lot of women, um, they're, they're shy in dealing with financial stuff. So with FinTech, hopefully that can help a bit of solution in terms of P2P lending. Um, 
and then you know we have uh, crowdfunding because um, even even in property now we have what you call the prop prop tech which is the property technology and that even helps uh, to to actually encourage women to actually invest in property through the platform without you know having to meet face to face. So it has uh, the flexibility for for women uh, who probably m they're usually shy, you know, to ask questions to meet people. So they can actually learn by themselves using the platform. So that's how I see um, how uh, technology can close the gender disparity. Okay, so uh, following up to that, what is your strategy then to make yourself uh, keep interested in this, you know, men's dominated uh, tech world? <laughs> How do I make myself interested? I guess um, since I started so early, um, I started everything too early actually. <laughs> that, you know, in business, if you start too early, you don't really make money. <laughs> so you better uh, be on time and doing things. But what I've gained advantage of is that I think I've done all that needs to do in the tech uh, industry. Um, I've done, I started one of the early e-commerce called plaza.com, now it's called blanja.com here in Indonesia. Uh, I've done uh, mobile content business. I was a venture capitalist, that's why now I've become an angel investor. Um, so for me, uh, to keep me interested is actually because I'm always seeing too far ahead, I guess. Um, when nobody created a venture capital, I started one like four years ago. There was no startup to invest, probably like 10 of them. <laughs> so, but then again, I didn't really make that much money because I got too early. But that what makes me um, always alive as an entrepreneur because I'm always excited to see new things. And now I'm more excited because I'm working with a number of startups, I invest in them, I mentor them, and now I know all the business model that they can do and make money after that. <laughs> so that's what keeps me going. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, please give applause to our panelists. Now we're going to moving on to our sessions, a Q&A session. Uh, all right, we already have some questions here. Uh, first question is from Andara. How to survive in the digital business today for women because the business cycle is still short. Even Twitter and Facebook business are starting to decrease. Uh, okay, so we don't know this question uh, should be for, but uh, do any of you want to uh, comment on that? Okay, Ibu, yeah, Sinta, silakan. Um, I, know, I think all technology cycle is short. So I guess the key is uh, to always innovate. Yeah, there's no other way. But you have to be uh, innovative and creative. Um, without that creativity or innovation, uh, I guess uh, you can outlive yourself uh, later on. Like uh, for me, I need to reinvent all the time because I'm in the tech space. Uh, it, it's literally in seconds, something new will come up. And you have just to keep updated all the time. And um, for me, it's always because you just do what is your passion. Um, so when you start a business that is tech-based, or any business actually, you just need to be passionate about it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, next question. Uh, what efforts should be made to uh, direct inclusive economic growth in supporting gender equality? Maybe this Ibu Amalia can answer. Actually, uh, for efforts to support the inclusive economic growth is uh, one, the first one is to in increase the female labor participation uh, in the labor force. And then uh, once they are participating in the labor, uh, in, the, in, the, in the economy, then it will increase the contribution of a woman income to the family. So I think the, the contribution of women income to the, the total economy will be captured by the second pillar of uh, inclusive economic uh, development index. So I think there are two ways uh, to increase or to induce the, in, the, the, the economic development, uh, inclusive economic development. One is the increasing female labor participation in the labor force, and then the second one is to reduce the gap 
between uh, female wages and uh, uh, male wages. Because you know that now there's still a gap between, on, on average, between women wages and uh, uh, men wages. Okay. All right, yes. Sorry, and, and just some of the research that we've done in the fund recently has, has touched on some of these topics here, looking at how can we increase female labor force participation, promote more inclusive growth. Um, and so we've developed models that look at gender and income inequality together, as well as the macroeconomic impacts of that. Um, and that's been applied to Argentina, Iran. We've got more work forthcoming on this too. But some of the policy implications that come out of it are things like revising tax policies that might have a penalty for secondary wage earners, offering a high quality, affordable childcare, whether it's through subsidies or through other kinds of, of tax or, or employer uh, programs. Um, thinking about um, uh, running anti-discrimination campaigns to address wage gaps. Uh, so campaigns can sometimes be done to help educate people on the importance of wage equality, gender equality, uh, and things like that. So uh, there's more research to be coming out of the fund, but these are just some of the policy implications that we're starting to identify and the impact they can have on inclusive growth. Thank you. Uh, we have run a question for you. Uh, this is from the audience. Does empowering women in the STEM have a bright future on economic inclusiveness. How is government support it by considering lack of time on social return? Yeah. Um, so our research has not looked in a lot of cases, we haven't looked specifically at STEM, so I'll talk a bit more about just education in general. Um, but the fact is that when we educate women, uh, we have better economic outcomes. So we've looked at it from um, improving access to education can have an impact, of course, on economic growth, um, which is positive for the economy as a whole. Um, and it can increase female labor force participation. It can reduce um, income inequality. It can also lead to higher economic diversification. So if we're thinking about STEM education in particular, when we're thinking about increasing a country's overall um, basket of goods that it's producing or, or exporting, um, when we have women being more involved in new technologies, learning about new ideas, learning about science, technology, engineering, and math, that then would play in directly into um, being able to innovate and, and develop new goods. And this is particu particularly important for, for countries that have traditionally relied on a narrow or a smaller basket of goods that they're producing, which means they're more, they're more susceptible to shocks. So things like commodity producers often uh, suffer when we don't have a very diverse economy. So if we can get more women involved in, in STEM education, um, and certainly just education overall, um, because there are still gender gaps, certainly when it comes to just overall levels of education. Um, and one other thing to consider, too, is the quality of education, which is something that um, we're starting to look at as well. It's not just about reducing gender gaps and kind of getting everybody into some sort of you know, mediocre or lower quality education, but it's thinking, too, about how can we raise the overall level of education for everybody so that when you do complete a secondary degree or secondary education, you have a high quality education that allows you to go out and compete, compete because now the workforce isn't just necessarily people in your, in your region or in your country, but it's potentially global too. Um, so it's the idea of being able to compete with, your, um, with, with the global competitors as well. Okay, next question uh, to Ibu Sinta again. Uh, please give information how we can start business in digital tech. That's a large question, actually. <laughs> uh, we can talk separately later, but basically uh, being in the tech space, everything is very flexible. You can even start by doing very, uh, very easy and very uh, small, like, like, like I said earlier, using your social media to start selling stuff. But um, I want to give example, uh, one of the startup that uh, I'm actually mentoring is called Jukir. It's, um, Jukir is um, the Gojek of parking attendants. So in Indonesia, uh, there's a lot of non-formal parking attendants on the street. So what this app does, we formalize this parking attendants on the street. So we give them um, uniform, we give them a mobile phone with the app inside, and so um, you can actually work with the government uh, for the parking attendance because you know parking is also under the uh, the local government. Um, and so what happened is um, now all these non-formal parking attendants they feel they're being represented because you know they have a uniform, they have like they have a job in a way. 
And what's exciting is um, we wanted these parking attendants to actually lend the mobile phone to their wife, to their uh, daughter or son or their family, basically, to use uh, to extend their business. So inside the phone, uh, we created also um, the ability for them to buy a mobile token, Pulsa, so they can start selling mobile token as well. So after the parking attendants goes home, you know, they can give the mobile phone to the wife, and the wife can start selling mobile tokens, and they can actually do uh, the PPOB, which is, uh, you know, paying the electricity, the water bill, and all that. So they can actually also uh, make money out of that if they can get you know, their neighbors to actually pay through their apps. So this is, this is just example how easy it is it's actually to start your own business using a very simple mobile app. There's a lot of opportunity and flexibility. Like for instance, um, Uber, there's like now, um, the, the regular taxi, there's only about 8% uh, women drivers, but with Uber now, it's like 14%. It's because of this flexibility, you know, when, when you have the app, you can actually do part-time at the end of the day. So that's just an example. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, the next question, we need to also realize the basic issues of gender-based violence. One out of three adult or young women are victims. Is their program friendly to their situation, maybe from the government? Okay. Yeah, by Ilyas. Uh, please open my slide number six. Uh, okay, uh, it seems that we are so worried with the woman, and it seems we underestimate with the woman in Indonesia. But we can say, we can see about in the data based on the wiki, uh, based on the Tokopedia. Number six. Num slide number six. Okay. As we think that women only go to the supermarket and as a buyer, but Tokopedia said no. 66% are purchased by women, okay. 55% seller in Tokopedia are women. It means women not only as a buyer, is also a seller, is almost 65%. Uh, and who, who, who is the woman is the young people, is with the age 20 to 29 is around 50%, with the age 30 and 39 is around 40%. So this is quite a good uh, data for, for, for this one. And what is the profession? The profession not only housewife for the buyer and seller, is only also a student, silver servant, and entrepreneur. So this is my kind of my answer to this question that really that we have a kind of opportunity and related before the, the digital area, big or the, the industry of 4.4, Maybe probably we think about women is only work in the home and worry take care of the children. But now they have an opportunity. We can work in their house together. We can earn their money. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we still have time for questions. So uh, we don't have any more questions from the uh, Slido. So maybe uh, I'm going to ask the audience here to raise their question. Okay. And just to add on, on gender-based violence too, in terms of gender budgeting programs, in our, in our conversations with country authorities, um, we've heard anecdotal evidence of this, and, and some of it is actually supported by data too, so it's not just anecdotal. But one example I'll give is that um, in this rural area in, in a sub-Saharan African country, um, they had tried to address women's access to water, um, and they were trying to reduce the amount of time women were spending fetching water every day, which could be upwards of two hours uh, each way. Uh, to get fresh water for the day. And so they built these wells. Uh, so it was all very good, in good intentions, building wells, um, and thinking that now women will have access to clean water and do not have to walk two hours each way uh, to get water. What they found, though, is that after building these wells, women were still walking two hours each way uh, to get water. And after seeing that the well was really going unused for a little over a year or so, they, they were surveying uh, the women to find out why they were not using the wells. And one of the answers that came up was, was a way to, uh, to avoid gender-based violence at home. Uh, so 
when you think about the idea of how you want to address gender inequality um, outcomes, it's, it's again that taking that holistic approach and really trying to figure out what are the key issues that women face, have them come to the table, ha listen to their, their opinions and their voices and what their needs are, and by doing that, then you can put programs in place that will allow women to potentially avoid gender-based violence. Um, so like Rwanda has a one-stop center. Um, I think there are now about 40 or so around the country. I, I could be off on that number, but there are <clears throat> quite a few around the country. And in these centers here, of course, the, the officials are trained on how to deal with gender-based violence. There's gender sensitivity training, um, and the women can go there and get the help that they need for themselves and for their children and their families and help reduce the cycle of gender-based violence. And again, a lot of this can come under uh, gender budgeting programs as well, but it's, it's quite critical to, to look at the entire picture and to really involve women in the conversations when you're thinking about what kinds of programs and policies you want to put in place. Okay, um, we're going to have another question. I think we have one more question, or not? Yes, we do. Uh, to Ibu Wini, technology development creates winners and losers in the economy. What policy is needed to support the losers? Um, that's quite hard questions to be answered. Um, yes, uh, that's right. The technology development creates, um, you know, winners and losers. So the thing is that uh, what the government will do to support the losers, of course, to do to provide some facilitation trainings to the losers so they can adapt to the the situation, so they can uh, ca they can gain uh, the opportunities. Uh, provided by the digital economy era. So I think so support from the government to, uh, to especially for the rural areas and for women is quite a lot already. So I think that can help to reduce the losers. Okay. Just yeah, if you one, want to ask. One of the things is just going back on the same thing again, but for the losers, uh, if we look at the well, where the lo job losses are going to be. I mean, in the Asia um, ADB outlook this year, we looked at the future work and effect on jobs. Uh, and it's possible or estimated that almost half the jobs that are lost are going to be the low-skilled jobs which are dominated by women. So what are the government policies to protect or to reskill these women becomes the issue. And that's where we go back to our central theme is re-education, retooling of the women. And I would just wonder, you know, what uh, policies is Indonesia going to do on that yeah. event? We have trainings actually, trainings for women uh, and also trainings to improve the skill of workers. So uh, meaning that uh, uh, when, uh, you know, when, when the digital economy coming and technology is adopted by the industries in Indonesia, they, 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 there, there must be some, some workers will lose the jobs. So, so meaning that this, the one who lost the jobs, then we need to do to provide some retraining to improve the skills. So, meaning that the one that cannot adopt the technology, so we, or the government, uh, should do the training to improve the skills so they can uh, upgrade their capabilities so they can find the new jobs, with with uh, the new jobs with the new um, with the the high technology. So, I think retraining, improving the skills of worker is one of the important things that the government has to do. Okay, uh, the next question. Uh, the panelists mostly encourage women to take exact science major. What about the role of social and humanitarian science in terms of boosting the women empowerment? <laughs> okay, maybe Ibu uh, Winnie can answer that again because uh, you said that women should take engineering more in the future. So maybe this is why the questions raised by the audience. Uh, this is my personal opinion, uh, probably, because uh, my experiences was that uh, when um, uh, we go to to, sci to, to to social science school, so we, we can see there's a lot of women already there, 
right? Oh, probably a majority and majority of students in the Faculty of Social Science are women. But if that is not the case in the Faculty of Engineering. If you go to the Faculty of Engineering, that most of them are men, actually, because I agree with uh, Ibu Cleo that the mindset uh, of engineering is now, according to the mindset of Indonesian culture, is school for men. But we need to change the mindset that engineering school is not for men only, it's for women also. So there's an opportunity for women to go to the engineering school to be the, the, the top level of the managerial, I mean, top management level in the probably technology industries. So I think we need to open up the minds of women in Indonesia that you also have an opportunity to, to make a career in the, in the engineering school or also in the technology industries or in the, uh, what do you call it, in the, um, uh, in the startup industries, you also can make money or uh, a lot. So I think it's about the perception and mindset again. If, if I might add, I think that there's two two things here, right? Uh, there's a, there's a, a deficit of women in in tech industry, so that's why it's better for them to 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 have an education in science and math and everything. Right? But I think it's, it's equally important to realize that in the new world, it's not, it's not only about the tech industry. This is the, the, the digital economy where the new opportunity comes up, right? I think all those edu education will be relevant. Uh, to, to give you some example, for example, the, there's now some, some startup who help the accounting of small firms, for example. So you have an education in accounting, it, it also relevant. Even if you if you like, for example, to tell a story and then you write um, quite nicely with, with your travels, for example, and then you, you, you can sell a package of, of the travel using your, your your fine writing, for example. That's, that's also important. I think I just want to make emphasize that this tech industry, but at, at the same time, there's a digital economy which gives opportunity for, for, for everybody, not, not only in, in tech industry, and so, so that's why I, I, I don't think uh, only the, uh, the, um, the science is, is, is relevant in, in, in the new world. I just want to clarify that the topic now is related with digital. So that's why in related to digital, we need the people know about the STEM. So that's why, in reality now, most of the school in technique in a uh, lot of women, a uh, lot of men. So that's why we need to push the women also uh, study for the robot related with the with with STEM. Why women do, do, do don't want to uh, study in women in Indonesia before? Because it's only mindset. This is only a culture. Basically, they can. Women can solve the problem with the matrix and, and, and so on. This is, this is only about the perception, so that's why. But in situation now, we don't need only know about related to mathematics and STEM and also. We have also want to soft skill. We have also want how to connect with the people, how to make the relationship with the skill, with the people. As, uh, as I have already talked with the owner of the uh, Kacang Garuda or so on, or related with the, about the BCA, President BCA, he said that we don't need, uh, we don't, this is, the background sometimes is not so important. We can train them, we can uh, give a lecture, give the skill for them. The most important thing that we have a soft skill, how to make relation, how to know about the other people, how to work. So in the, the work situation, we need also a soft skill like language and, and uh, so on. So it means that why, why the question, why the answer the question that we, we don't think we need women not, uh, not have to be as, uh, know about STEM also, it's also all of it, because we are talking about the, the uh, digital, so we need women can know about the STEM. Thank you. Okay, uh, so do we have more questions? 
Okay, so we can accept questions from the audience on the floor then. Okay, Ibu, yeah. please uh, state your name and the institution that you represented. Yeah, uh, thank you. My name is Stevie. I'm from uh, Safi Amira Women Crisis Center, one that asked about um, whether we have programs that are really friendly to uh, women who are victims of gender-based violence. Because I think this is a, this is a big, big, big uh, population, I suppose. So it is very important, I think, for the government to have special um, attention to this. Because as far as we know, um, the attention from the government to deal with this group of people is, um, there are attention, but uh, is still under the women's um, empowerment and for the children. And for this uh, uh, ministry as well, um, attention is more to the children, not enough for the adult and young women. So I'm really curious whether um, Ibu Sinta, for instance, or from Bapenas, or from um, Kementerian Ekonomi, to have like a scheme which is potential for this group of people, because their problem is not only about their self-confidence, but also the pressure from the society, from their family. If they want to try, they don't know where to go. Well, we can let them know about this, but um, uh, people tend to not believe really on them because, you know, these self-confidence things. So I'm just curious, maybe Ibu Sinta can also um, have a kind of uh, ideas to, well, of course, I'm not asking for solutions, but uh, access, for instance, and also from Babanas and Ibu uh, Economy. Okay, thank you. Ibu and maybe Ibu. from IMF also. Okay, so first, <laughs> thank you. Start from others. Okay, so maybe Ibu Amalia first. Uh, Ibu Widi uh, first. Pa or Pak Julius. Pak Julius. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, basically, uh, when we have a policy, at first. We don't care this is policy for women or we don't care for a man. This is the same. But in Indonesian culture, this is about the culture. Uh, uh, men highest than women. Men have to have opportunity and because of culture or religion and and, 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 and so on. But when they are in the market, like Bu, Bu Sri Mulyani said, when they have a school, when the, when the I mean, elementary and until st student, they have more women have smart and clever. But after their job, working job, they cannot get higher position. So, I think the, the, the policy can offer all the people, women or men can enter. But sometimes uh, when some people can be a Sri Mulyani and Bu Wini, woman to be high position, but only small people. But the policy is mean not, not, not to, to be have handicap for women. We can, Bu Fifi also have a position. As a, as, as a, a woman, but he can, but still related with the culture, I guess. This is my, my, my opinion. Culture, maybe the religion, the religion means that we, uh, we make a, a wrong conclusion for the religion. religion. Maybe religion doesn't think that women have the lower, no. But we have something, uh, make mistake, make understand what, what this one. Okay, then Lisa, you can add. Um, 
uh, so I, I don't have a lot to add to this um, because it is a relatively new topic for the fund to be looking at. Um, if you'd asked me, you know, five years ago as an economist at the fund, if I'd be looking at gender-based violence, I, I would have said, no, this is not something that we typically look at. Um, but I think now we do realize that there is a macro-critical component to this and that, you know, again, outside of the, the human aspect of it, thinking about it from the fund's mandate, we think about this as how does gender-based violence impact economic growth and economic volatility? And I think the argument can be made that there is indeed uh, an impact there, and it's something that the fund uh, could and, and hopefully will uh, look at. So, um, you know, in terms of gender budgeting programs, I think it's easier for us to identify what countries have done, and then we can see what are some of the policy recommendations that countries can do to address gender-based violence. And again, the one-stop centers in Rwanda are, are something that come up. Um, New Zealand just implemented um, paid leave uh, for victims of gender-based violence, too. So there are lots of things that countries can do to address this, and it's something that we, we hopefully be looking at uh, in the near future and be able to have those discussions with ministries of finance and country officials and, and offer policy advice on this. Okay, good point. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, it's also for you. So Lisa, from your research, what the most bear in implementing general mainstreaming in the fiscal policy, especially for the developing country? Sorry, what, what was the, the most what? Uh, what is the most barrier? Oh, the biggest barrier. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, certainly uh, uh, quite a few barriers. Um, I think the first barrier that any country has to overcome is just um, the, the willingness to adopt uh, gender budgeting and to adopt gender equality policies. And in some of our conversations with ministries of finance, there has been a bit of pushback here. Um, but our goal as, as economists and having those conversations with, um, with ministries of finance is to show the macroeconomic losses from gender inequality. Um, and so to do that, we've developed tools, we've developed analysis, We'll be putting out a toolkit, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, that will allow um, kind of anybody, um, civil society organizations, academics, uh, people who are not trained economists, to look at the impact of gender inequality uh, on growth and other macroeconomic outcomes in their countries. And so that at least opens the door, I think, to ministries of finance. It's, it's having that um, kind of willing um, counterpart uh, to listen to this and then that's when we can have that conversation and start to think about how can we break down other barriers that exist, um, what kinds of programs need to be put into place and, and really what can we expect to gain um, from having improvements in gender equality. All right, thank you. Uh, we still have a little bit of time, okay, from this side. Thank you. My question, uh, I'm Novi from Canadian Embassy. My question is uh, maybe going to Lisa again regarding the gender responsive budgeting because uh, that's also my personal interest. I think uh, Indonesia has started since 2009 and also very, what's that, uh, again, led by Ministry of Finance. So uh, in my opinion, it's in terms of policy, it's already uh, good. We have several, even to sub-national uh, level. Only, yeah, of course, the challenge is on the implementation, implementation of the policy itself. So from your research, I want to know whether it's including Indonesia or only, because I heard several times you talk about uh, examples from Africa. And what I think what people would love to hear more here in Indonesia from my uh, experience before, before working with the embassy also, but working on this issue is also to hear more on the example link of if government implement gender responsive budgeting, uh, what is the link to reduce the gap, uh, uh, yeah, more to the outcome stories. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, so again, I will note that the, the research on looking at the causal links between gender budgeting and outcomes we're working on right now. Um, I will talk a bit about India. Um, so like I said, most of my, my examples have been from Africa, and that's just because I've been um, traveling back and forth and working with the African department quite a bit over the last six months or so. Um, so those are just very much fresh in my mind. And they are, again, very good examples of, of good gender budgeting programs. Um, but from this region here, um, we actually did not cover Indonesia in our survey. Um, at the time we did the survey, we realized that Indonesia was not one of the most prominent uh, gender budgeting initiatives. And so we, we only covered the ones where they've been doing this for a long time. And we've, we've seen um, kind of uh, 
uh, a sustained and, 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 and improvements uh, in terms of gender budgeting efforts. Um, but we did look at India. Um, we also looked at Australia, the Philippines, and, and Korea uh, as some of our examples. And let me just give you a couple of highlights from a few of the countries. What we found in, in India is that gender budgeting has been done at the national and the state level. And this is one country where we actually were able to do a causal analysis on gender budgeting, looking at in states that have done gender budgeting, did they have better outcomes in terms of gender equality? Uh, so we looked at uh, uh, several outcomes. We looked at primary school enrollment, secondary school enrollment, um, spending on education. We looked at infrastructure and a few other outcomes. What we found is that in India, in states that had gender budgeting, there was a, a direct impact on uh, female school enrollment at the primary school level. We did not see anything at the secondary school level, but this is at least kind of the first uh, phase of evidence, uh, so to speak, that is showing that there's a causal impact on, of gender budgeting programs having a positive impact on school enrollment. Um, there'll be more research hopefully coming out uh, in the near future. We plan to look at um, doing a more kind of global survey, um, but this of course requires micro-level data, which is very time consuming to work with. Uh, so we are working on kind of country by country here, putting together hopefully five to six countries or so, uh, and with that work coming out, um, <laughs> I always underestimate how much time it takes, um, probably within a year or so. Um, in terms of other countries in the region too, Australia was actually the, the originator of gender budgeting, started in the mid-1980s, um, and had been doing gender budgeting for years, uh, and stopped in about 2015 or so, um, but they're planning to, to pick that back up. Uh, the Philippines is another country that's done gender budgeting too. One of the aspects of the Philippines that's, that's somewhat unique compared to some other countries is that they had just earmarked a certain percent of the budget uh, for gender budgeting, and so basically every ministry or department was told to spend 5% of their budget on, on gender issues. Um, and what we found from our survey is that that, necessar that wasn't necessarily the, the best way to go because some of the, the departments were just spending on um, things that we would not necessarily consider to be crucial for women's economic development and support. So things like ballroom dance lessons were included under uh, gender budgeting initiatives. So um, this kind of earmarking of, of funds can work, but it's not necessarily um, the best way to go. And then um, in Korea, too, uh, there's a gender budgeting initiative there that was led uh, by Parliament um, and also some CSOs in the area. Um, and one thing that's come out of Korea that's that's quite innovative is the fact that they're doing a lot of auditing. They're doing gender-based, um, or I'm sorry, gender disaggregated data collection, doing the analysis and then auditing the programs too, which is very rare uh, for gender budgeting. So, so there are certainly countries in, in the region that have lots to offer in terms of innovative techniques and, and um, policies and procedures that they've put into place. Uh, and like I said, the book only highlights uh, four of the countries, uh, but there's certainly, certainly more uh, that, that follow up in the working papers and that there's a bit more detail in some other countries in the working papers. Okay, I hope uh, that um, clear up the questions. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately the time uh, that we have already uh, finished, so that's why I have to conclude this uh, discussion. Uh, so the first conclusion probably, uh, women's participation in the digital economy is growing globally and promising a lot of opportunities in the future. And then the second question is the government needs to enforce the gender policy and gender budgeting stronger in order to provide better ecosystem, access to financial system, and reducing stereotypes in the digital economy. And the third uh, conclusion is there's an urgent need to, uh, of communicating or campaigning the existing programs to encourage women to participate and keep them interested in the digital transformation world. So for example, we, from this discussion, we know that the government has a coding mom programs and also a, uh, prioritizing women for LPDP. So next time if I apply it, then I can get yes. it prioritized. Okay, thank you. So please, uh, that's recorded on the video. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so and also this kind of seminar, I think uh, really useful in order to discuss this matter and also providing information more to us about what have the government uh, do in order to support the women participation in Indonesia especially. So thank you very much to our panelists. Please give them a warm applause. And of course, to all of the audience for uh, great questions, please give yourself an appreciation by clapping your hands. <laughs> and also to the Minister of Finance for uh, organizing this seminar. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, finally, uh, I am Valerina Daniel, very honored to facilitate this discussion and hopefully we can meet again in this very good uh, environment to discuss more on women participation in an inclusive economy. So good afternoon, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you moderator and all speaker, please remain on the stage for the handover of token of appreciation. Please line up from Ibu Amalia Adiningar, and then Mr. Julius, followed by Ms. Lisa Kolovich, followed by Bapak Erwin Haryono, and then Mrs. Cleo Kawawaki, Ibu Sinta Danuardoyo, and Ms. Valerina Daniel. And now I am delighted to invite Assistant Minister of Finance for Governor Expenditure, Bapak Suminto, please welcome to the stage. Thank you, Bapak Suminto. Thank you, moderator and all of the speakers. You may now go back to your seat. <clears throat> 